I'm Matt Turner, I'm from London in the UK, and I've come out here to talk about, I call it software networking interfaces. Uh, this is not like SDN, if anybody's looking for that. Uh, this is more the building blocks. So it's not like the kernel and the RCU subsystem, but it's what are the different types of interface and bridge and sort of switch um, in a system, and how does that play with things like IP tables and NetFilter, and how do we use that to network up uh, VMs and importantly containers these days? So this is basically this is a like super deep dive. There would be no big, um, you know, philosophical statements from me. This is sort of a deep dive into um, the week I had to spend learning this stuff when I had a slightly wonky Kubernetes deployment that I had to debug because I realized I didn't really have a clue how all the networking worked. I thought you just kind of turned, told VirtualBox to attach it to your network and it kind of worked. Um, so I learned all of this stuff, and now I'm here to tell you, um, so you don't have to spend as long doing it. And it's 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 quite interesting. Uh, I work at a company called Native Wave. We are a cloud native managed service provider and consultancy, helping enterprises move to uh, the public cloud and cloud native technologies. If anybody wants to talk to me about that, it's my fiduciary duty to inform you of that. Um, <laughs> But that's all I'll say about it. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to do a quick kind of networking 101, like really quick, because um, I polled a few people over dinner yesterday. Um, I'm sure a lot of you know exactly what a, like a route table is and how TCP works. Um, but for those who don't, I'll just go through it really quickly. Then we'll then look at all of the weird and wacky types of uh, network interface on a Linux system. Uh, we'll look at uh, ways of plugging those together, basically. This is the main sort of thesis of this talk. Um, is that's a really good mental model, and then this stuff starts to make sense. And then we'll look at some of the systems, like the sort of uh, yeah, Docker networking and overlay networks that get built on top of this, but I may not have time to get right the way into that, because that gets super complicated. So yeah, this is not about IP, TCP at a low level. I think that's actually been covered. Um, or sort of you know how IP6 is going to work, and it's not really about SDN. But an SDN system, obviously, is an API where you say, hey, I would like a, a network, like a virtual network that looks like this with sort of uh, these places I can plug into it, um, and, and the way that you can now define have declarative networking is that it is software defined, it's all virtual, so it's all built out of the building blocks I'm going to show you. So, yeah, very quickly on networking, um, everybody remembers from college what Ethernet is, right? It's, it's the sort of the layer two, pro there are a bunch of layer two protocols, but it's the one that you're probably going to use. Um, remember the OSI networking model right from layer one, like do I put five or 12 volts down this wire through to layer seven, which is uh, basically HTTP these days, but other application protocols like the MySQL protocol. Um, the, the first of those protocols on the wire is, is the layer two protocol, probably internet, you know, those, those gray wires you used to plug uh, machines together with the RJ45 connectors on the end. The first, the first thing that goes on that uh, stack is, is ethernet, which is the layer two protocol. It addresses things with a MAC address, which is uh, these six bytes, written as these uh, six uh, pairs like this. You recognize that kind of thing. Um, and it has a, there's an adjacent protocol called ARP, the address resolution protocol, which is kind of DNS for Ethernet. So that says, hey, I've got an IP address I want to reach. You know, the IP, the internetworking protocol, has got my packet all the way to like the last hop. I need to get to this IP, and I know it's on this local network. But which one of you computers actually, like, which network card should I be sending this frame to? Which one of these computers is, is it at? So ARP says, hey, I have IP address 1234. Like, what Mac should I actually be sending it to? And that's done by a, sort of an Ethernet broadcast. It's a really simple thing. Um, so you can run the ARP command on your computer, and you will see that, you know, for, for certain IP addresses, um, they, are map, they are the Ethernet layer two protocol, hardware protocol, and they're mapped through to a, to a hardware address. And it tells you which interface to actually bang the, the bits out of right, to get onto the right network. Um, VLANs are something you'll need to know about for this talk. Um, this is a virtual LAN. It um, standardizes IE802.1Q. Uh, so if you hear Q in networking, they're almost always talking about VLANs. This kind of simulates you having multiple networks um, with one set of wires and one switch. So it's, you can plug a bunch of computers together and rather than having three switches to make, put them on three separate networks, you can just use one and um, tell it to pretend that it's three separate ones. So each VLAN has a sort of a short numeric ID, like one. Um, uh, and what you would normally do is you would set the ports on a switch to be on a particular VLAN, right? So maybe all the ports on the left like are, are sort of switch one, network one, and all the ports on the right are network two. So that's, that's virtual LANing. Um, the, the reason it gets, so that's meant to be completely transparent and it's a really strong sort of security isolation mechanism. Um, 
the reason we care is that you can put one of these ports into what's called trunk mode, which says, like, I'm the uh, administrator's workstation. Say I've got a switch pretending to be two completely separate networks. Well, I want my, my admin laptop to be on both. So you put the port into trunk mode, and then you have to add an extra little um, piece of information to the Ethernet frame header. You have to actually add the, you, you, you can then be on any VLAN, so you have to basically say which VLAN you want to be on. So you send the VLAN ID in the Ethernet header to one of these trunk ports, and then you get onto whichever one of these like uh, virtualized LANs that you want. Um, so think of it as like a multi, sort of multiplexing system. Um, but this, this will become important. Uh, IP tables, which is a very big topic and actually doesn't really even exist anymore these days. I'm not going to go into it and VPF and NetFilter and all of that stuff. Um, but it's a kernel subsystem that basically has a bunch of hook points and can do things to packets, right? So a packet traverses the kernel, actually goes through a lot of different stages. Um, and you can pick them up at uh, a lot of these points with IP tables and say, right, if the packet matches these criteria, I want to do this. I want to drop it on the floor. Or more interestingly, I want to manipulate it. So you see that destination address it thinks it's going to. I want you to tear that out and put this new destination address in. And then when it finally gets through to the part of the kernel which decides, like, looks at that ARP thing and decides where to send it, which is actually quite late, um, it'll end up going somewhere else. And that's how NAT is built. That's all you need to know about IP tables. So natting versus routing, just in case anybody's forgotten. Um, two kind of ways to move packets around the internet, I guess. Um, when IP4 was invented, there were about three people on the internet, so it was fine. We, you know, we came up with four billion addresses. We were never going to run out. Um, so now I'd be on this computer in my house, and it has an IP address, like a sort of actual public IP address, and I want to talk to one of Amazon's servers. right? So I have this IP address, and I put that IP address in my packet. Um, and the, the inter-networking protocol gets me there, right? So I know that I have to get to my home router, which is what we still call these things, but it, is, it was actually a router in those days. And it would say, oh, yeah, you want to you be over there. I know where the sort of next hop is. I'll send it to that one. And the packet would get here with, with my IP, this, this actual IP of my home computer, as the source address. And then it would, it would just come back. And at every point, a routing decision is taken about which, uh, which wire to send the packet down, where, you know, where the next hop is. And everything was publicly addressable. So from, from this computer, I could directly address this computer and vice versa. That has a bunch of security problems, and we ran out of IP addresses like real fast. So now basically everything NATs, um, which means that I have a private IP range in my house, and my router isn't actually a router anymore. It's a NAT box. So I, I aim for um, Amazon server. I aim for this IP, and the packet gets to, to this box which then says, oh, yeah, right, what we're going to do is some, some NAT. So I'm going to use that IP tables thing. I'm going to take the source address off, because this source address is, is a private address that doesn't mean anything on the internet. I'm going to take the source address out. I'm going to substitute it with my address and send it over. So I've translated the network address. It's going to get here. And this thing says, right, yeah, I hold the one IP that like Amazon.com's DNS record points to. You can't address this computer again. It has a private address. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the other thing. I'm going to take that destination address you wanted, which is mine, and I'm going to replace it with this address and send it on. Uh, so you hit port 80 and it knows, right, port 80 is, is a port forward. Um, so port 80 goes to the, to the web server. Um, so I'm going to, because you hit 80, that's how I'm actually differentiating the machines. It's based on port number. Because you hit 80, I'm going to put the web server's address in. And then when it comes back, obviously, it's, it's coming back to what, Amazon thinks the, the source address was, sorry, which is this, because, it, again, it got replaced. And then some mechanism called contract connection tracking kind of does the port mapping thing in reverse. It goes, OK, well, I sent this out from port 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, random source port number that you wouldn't normally care about. Um, but because it's coming back to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, ah, yes, it must be the, translate, the stream translation I've got in place for, for this laptop rather than like your wife's laptop. Um, so, so that's, that's how that works. So that's how these two computers, neither of which has a publicly like, addressable address, publicly addressable interface, um, can talk to each other. So NAT is going to be important too. Uh, I think one final thing, the root table. So this is, this is how you know where to send packets, right? This gives just the next hop. So you look at the whatever network um, the, the IP address is in, what, what the subnet is, the sort of prefix of it. Um, and this, this gives you the next hop. So I think this was ripped off my home computer when I was at home. So yeah, anything aiming for the network 172.17 wants to go out of, of this interface. Um, anything aiming for, for 127.001, uh, sorry, 00 slash 8, uh, is going to go out of this interface, the loopback interface. And then everything else goes, goes out of this interface and hits, hits my home router. 
Oh, yeah, right, okay, I'll go really quickly through this. Um, we used to have, the internet used to be divided up into like big orthogonal blocks and it was very easy to make a mental model of it, but it was really wasteful in terms of number space. So there used to be three different sizes of network, class A, B, and C, but we only, you know, but we only ever had, so class A was like eight bit, so an eight bit prefix, you just varied this one number. Um, so we only could have 128 of these things. Right, and they could only be, you know, not, not very many Bs or Cs. So we very rapidly ran out of space. Um, but this is how the internet was sort of originally designed to work. And you still hear people talk about class A when they mean a slash eight network. It's actually, it's almost certainly not one of the original class A blocks. Um, and some of them are reserved. So the your famous 192.168.10 and then the 172.16.17.18 um, were reserved to be private. Uh, which meant that you could use those addresses. Uh, you didn't have to be allocated them by IANA. You could use those addresses, and they would uh, not clash with anything on the real internet because everybody else could use them. But you had to hide them behind behind that. Um, yeah, and now we use CIDR. We use classless routing, um, which means that you can you, we we do much more fine grained allocation of um, of network numbers of, of subnet IDs, and we write them down like this. So I can carve any part of the address space out. And I just specify the start of my network and then the, like, the length of this prefix. Going to stop boring you soon. Um, so you remember your th sort of three types of packet. Um, well, four, four types of, of uh, transmission. So unicast is I want to send a, a packet to that machine. Broadcast is I want to send a packet to all machines. Multicast is I want to send it to a subset. Um, the way that's implemented in IPv4 is a little bit of a hack. Um, and then any cast is, I wanna, there's a subset of machines and I wanna send it to precisely one of them. Right, the, the last one I promised, DHCP is um, saying, I want an IP address, I can't choose my own IP address because it might clash, I want a central authority, a server to tell me that IP address. So before we bootstrap the sort of layer three IP layer, I'm gonna do an ethernet broadcast. So I'm gonna ask every machine on the network if it's a DHCP server, if it's got the authority to tell me what IP I can use, um, and it'll, it'll get back to me and I'll then assign um, myself, I'll then start using that IP. The important point about this is that it's, it's an ethernet thing and it's, a, it's broadcast. So that the, there are other ways of allocating IP addresses, like you know, getting a notebook and going around to each machine and, and typing them in, um, which sounds silly, you know, DHCP was meant to automate that, but the problem with D DHCP is you do need certain uh, types of networking infrastructure in place that can do sort of lower level broadcast to bootstrap that layer three. Right, now we just did like four years of college in, in five minutes, like you, you can pay me afterwards. Um, I have a gray box. This is a computer. This is a, ho in the most abstract sense, right? This is a host. And if we draw a blue arrow into it, this is a network connection, right? Um, so this might be ETH zero. Um, these days, it's actually not ETH zero is Ethernet adapter zero. These days, it's not called that. It'll be it'll be given a new name by by UDEV based on its sort of location on the bus. So this is an Ethernet adapter on you know bus bus zero slot two or something. Um, but the, your interface has a name. We'll call it ETH zero. Um, and this is a network adapter. And the sort of mental model I want to introduce is that this this has an arrow on the end. This is kind of dangling. So imagine I've taken that RJ45 connector, the actual physical cable, and I've plugged it into the machine. That sort of male, I hate to gender these things, but it's quite a good mental model, that kind of um, plug rather than the socket is like dangling in my computer so I can, I can use it. But to use it, I have to assign it an IP address, right? To do anything useful with it, I have to give it an IP address. If I want to buy TAT off Amazon, then um, I'm going to need to talk to the other side of the planet, so I need to use the inter-networking protocol. So I give this thing an IP address. Given that IP address, there's sort of two main things I can do with it. I can um, connect out, because if I'm going to talk to Amazon, I need a destination address to come back to, so I can use the connect system call. I can connect to something and say, a uh, ping's actually a really bad example, because obviously ping doesn't use connect, spot the obvious mistake, um, doesn't talk TCP. but. Uh, imagine this was curl, right? I can, I can curl Google, um, so I can use that connect system call and I can use that address and I can, I can call out. The other thing I can do is I can accept traffic on the way in, so I can use the bind system call and I can bind to that address. So I can say I want to listen on uh, port 80. And the star actually means like all interfaces because we've only got one of these wires at the moment. Um, so I want to bind to port 80 and accept any connections that come to 192.168.0.10 
assuming those packets somehow magically land like down this blue wire, which is all to do with that ARP and Ethernet and routing and whatever, assuming they get there, um, I will pick them up. Uh, and if they're addressed to TCP port 80, UDP port 80, um, they, will, they will get to it. And so the green box is a Unix process. They will get to this Nginx process, which has made the system call bind and say it's, it's interested in port 80. Great, simple, right? We all know how networks work. Um, there are certain things I can now start to do. So the first thing I can do is I can put, I can assign that interface to addresses. It's not very common, but I, I totally can. And I can give it a 192.168 address and a 172.16 address. And again, as long as the outside world conspires to get both types of packet to me, as long as uh, the rest of the world understands that this machine is kind of weirdly on, on both networks, uh, there's nothing wrong with me giving it both addresses. And then this bind star 80 call will actually have Nginx um, receiving anything addressed to 172.16.10 or 192.168.0.10 um, on the HTTP port. If I don't want to do that, if I only want to actually accept packets addressed to one of those addresses, remember, same, same wire here, same interface, um, I, can, I can tell Bind specifically that I actually only want to listen on, on that address. Um, and you should, you should be doing this kind of thing anyway in the sort of days of, uh, of computers, because as we'll see, as soon as you get containers or VMs or something involved, your computer's going to have a whole <laughs> bunch of network interfaces that you probably didn't even know was there. So you should be listening on a, on a specific address. So yeah, the previous thing was a little bit weird. Maybe I do want to be on two networks, but you know, if you sort of think of the physical intuition of this, like probably got sort of two cables, my two networks are probably two separate switches, right? Or two internet drops or something. Um, so a computer can have more than one interface. And back in the olden days, that meant buying another PCI card, right? I'm sure we've all built our own sort of home switches and routers this way by getting an old box and plugging two PCI cards in. So you now have two interfaces, ETH0 and ETH1. We'll call them for simplicity and yeah, if they're on different, they really have to be on different networks. If they're on different networks, they can both get an IP. And now I'll call to bind to 192.168, you know, it sets the traffic up like this, or I can bind to the other address, um, and that'll, that'll take packets coming in off the other interface. So what is this? I keep saying interface or adapter. What is this? Well, it is an interface in the sense of a, a meeting between two things, the interface of two different things, the interface of sort of the outside world and, and this physical wire, and then this, this blue dangling blue arrow I've drawn on the inside, which is actually much more of a sort of figment of software imagination than you might think. Um, AKA network adapter, because it is actually sort of adapting something. It's doing a bit of translation from, you know, this is a, this is a physical wire with five volts or 12 volts or photons going up and down it, depending on whatever layer one protocol we're using, and then the, the sort of intuition is actually that these, this dangling blue arrow is like a unified software interface thing, dangling RJ45 thing, to which I can do stuff like assign IP addresses, call, call connect, call bind. Um, so if you think of one of these traditional interfaces, and I actually don't know the name for this. We're running this talk. I actually ended up in like kernel headers and stuff to see the enums that were used to sort of, with that Linux uses to keep track of interfaces and decide what type they are. Um, and there was there's sort of no name for like an actual like interface interface like I plugged a PCI card in. So if anybody, you know, there's actual kernel developers here, if anybody wants to tell me what I should be calling this thing. Um, but this is like an interface backed by hardware. So there is a PCI card, um, this black box, and then the yellow box is kind of the software side of this. So a, a big part of it is, is the driver, right, the software um, that actually puts the right values in the right registers and raises the right interrupts on this Intel E1000 to tell it to, to bang those voltages up and down on the wire. So there's the driver part of it, but then there's this sort of universal, oh, it's an interface, it's a thing that you can connect and bind and assign addresses to. Um, there is actually, of course, a bit in the middle called the firmware, and that's why it's called firmware, because it's halfway between hard and soft. So that's the sort of you know, software that, that ships on your, on your card. Um, uh, but yeah, if you, if you think of this kind of split, then the rest of it makes more sense. Um, and this is exactly what the, the drivers do, right? Is they unify, they make, all, however different this stuff is and however you talk to the firmware, they make it all look the same on, on the inside. So I could have another interface. Well, this isn't ETH1, this is, um, we're just gonna call this foo. So what happens if I want another of these dangling blue arrows to do something with to start assigning addresses to? Um, 
it could be an Ethernet interface coming in from the outside, or it could be getting frames uh, from somewhere else, right? It could be entirely a figment of our imagination, not backed by any hardware at all. Um, so where would it get its frames from? Like it's, it's, it's saying, I got a one, I got a zero, I got a three. Those are bytes then. I got a one, I got a zero, I got another one. Um, where, are these, where are these bits going to be coming from? You know, that we're, we're, we've assigned an IP, we've said this is an IP interface. Uh, I want you to sort of pass this and interpret it as an IP packet containing TCP information, containing HTTP, containing you know, uh, TLS, containing JSON, or whatever level of abstraction we built ourselves to these days. Um, well, I could, have an, I could have a Unix process generate these things. Let's call it packet D, the packet daemon. So maybe foo is another one of these dangling arrows, like an interface. Um, but it's not backed by a piece of hardware that, that sends photons down a wire. It's backed by a, a process that says, okay, thanks. Um, I saw those bits. Let me reply with these other bits. Um, so I can give that thing an address if I actually want to start talking to it, want to start talking to packet D rather than to whatever's on the end of that wire. Um, and you notice I changed the name to, to ton zero because this is what's called a, a tunnel interface. Um, so now I can use ping from before, and it, actually ping does work in this example. Um, and I can ping 172.16.0.10. And instead of, as I say, sending, sending voltages down a wire, uh, I just send the actual the Ethernet frame that ping generates. It just goes to this thing, packet D, right, that actually just sort of receives it in a loop. And it's only about a page of C. You can look it up on the internet. It's only about a page of C to sort of to make the right syscalls to say, yes, I want to I wanna accept all of the frames that are being sent to me um, and to sort of parse out just the minimum information from that ICMP packet and to craft a reply that makes sense and to send it back. Um, so it is, yeah, it is only about a page of C to write this packet D thing to kind of pretend to be a really simple special purpose computer on the other end of that wire that only knows how to respond to pings. Um, and incidentally, and I won't go into this in great detail either, incidentally, this is how you make a VPN. Um, so if I want to start, if I want ping to send packets off to the other side of the internet, but I, I, don't, tr I don't want them to actually go down this wire sort of raw because I don't trust this wire, I think there might be somebody like listening in on it or something, um, or this, it's why I doesn't have permission to talk directly into, you know, to the other machine I want, because I need to be, it's in like an Amazon VPC or something. Um, the, the kind of mechanism behind a VPN is that you make one of these, these tunnel devices, ping thinks it's talking to 172.16.0.10, that, uh, those frames don't go straight down a wire, they end up in, in, in a Unix process, which actually then wraps them, you know, encrypts them, puts them in a, a, a tunnel of some kind, and then does address them through this, does actually send them out across the internet, but they're, they're wrapped in whatever Packet D wants to do to them. Packet D kind of makes, makes new um, frames based on the old ones, and that, that's the general mechanism behind a VPN. Um, so what if I want, this, this is a little thing that can respond to pings, right? So I can run ping on this local machine and Packet D will get back to me and it says, you know, zero milliseconds, like uh, great lag, go play Counter-Strike now. Uh, kind of response from Packet D. But if I want something else to be able to talk to it from the outside, I need to be able to um, get the stuff that's coming in here to here. So how do I do that? There's a few ways. One of them, this is why we went over NAT versus routing, right? One of them is NAT. Um, so you would address, uh, you know, the packet comes in, address to 192.168.0.10, but then I've written some ITP tables rules that say, I oh, write any, any pings, any, you know, ICMP echo requests that are, address to that, actually rip that address out, put this address in, and then the kernel will be like, okay, and it's gonna go uh, there and hit packet D instead, and then you do the same thing on, on the way out. Or I could actually route it, um, which means the packet comes in from the outside world, address to 172.16.0.10, um, but it, it hits this interface, and the kernel kind of looks at it and goes, well, that's not the address on this interface, so it's not meant for anything that's kind of bound to this, but oh, IP forwarding is turned on, so let me see if I actually know where 172.16 is. It looks in that route table, and it says, oh yeah, I know where that is, so I've been told I'm a router today, I've been told to IP forward, so I'm gonna uh, send it on. The, the issue with that is that you, uh, you would have to get packets, packets addressed to 172.16.0.10 would have to like physically turn up on this wire, and that isn't gonna happen 
on like in a simple system on a local network uh, because of it, it's ARP, right, that's used for that service discovery. So somebody will say, hey, who's got 172.16.0.10? Uh, and the kernel will not issue an ARP reply down this wire because it's like, well, this is, that, that's this interface's address. It's, one nine, it's a 192.168. So it won't say yes. So you basically need to, so that like, ARP is sort of, you know, lazy service discovery for, for um, IPs. Uh, for MAC addresses, ARP's not going to respond in that case, so you need to like hard code, you need to tell the other machines that if they want 172.16, yes, it really does need to go like down this wire, it needs to be aimed for this MAC address. Um, and you do that with like a static root entry or something, or BGP, more of, more of which we'll see later. The, f the other thing I can do, you notice that these two interfaces actually only had IP addresses on up to this point, and that's fine, right? There are multiple different types of address, uh, you know, this interface can have many, many IP addresses, and it, can also, it also has a MAC address because it is actually an Ethernet right, adapter. It has to have a MAC address. Um, this thing, there's absolutely no requirement on this thing to have a MAC address at all. Like, if you're not going to be talking if you, Ethernet to it, um, you don't need one. But we can, and you'll notice the subtle name change from TON0 to TAP0. Um, we can change the type of that slightly from, from one of these tunnel interfaces. <laughs> which is layer three only to a TAP interface, which is also layer two and also speaks like Ethernet, virtual Ethernet. And we can add another type of address. We can add a MAC address. And at that point, I've got a MAC address. This thing is an Ethernet interface. It understands Ethernet, so I can start doing things like taking my virtual RJ45 and plugging it into switches, plugging it into Ethernet switches. Um, so before I go on, right, we've already seen three types of, of interface here. Right? We've seen an actual Ethernet real interface, whatever the hell I meant to call it. We've seen a, a ton, sorry, physical, we'll call it physical. We've seen a physical interface, we've seen a ton, and we've seen a tap, right? And all of them, if you think of, of this, this arrow being a figment of software's imagination, exactly the same as this, but backed by, you know, in this case, this is backed by some hardware driven by a driver, and in these cases, these things are backed by Unix processes. So just like I can take two physical computers, two physical RJ45s, click, into a switch, um, I can do the same thing virtually, hence the you know so, uh, virtual software networking, um, into a virtualized switch into a Linux bridge. So, important mental model, dangling arrows, plugs, let's call them. Uh, bridge is a thing with virtual sockets. I can plug them in. There we go. They're now on the same network. Um, so this packet D can now talk to the outside world to any other computers physically plugged into the switch that's, that's plugged into the E1000, because it's, it's on the network, right? It's not like it's on a separate network and we're, we're doing some fiddling around forwarding packets or like manipulating them. It's now on the network. So there's probably, you know, an actual physical switch here with another physical gray box. And this is like I've taken, I've got two physical switches and I've, I've plugged them together, right? It just gives me more ports. So I've, technically speaking, I've, ex I've extended that, that one network um, a network is, is kind of defined by a broadcast domain, so it's the boundary, like a, a layer two network is if, I'm, if I emit a broadcast, how far does it get, right? Because broad, Ethernet broadcasts don't get through IP forwarding, but they do get through, they do get repeated by actual physical switches. So I've extended my broadcast domain like inside my computer. It's like getting another physical switch, except it's, it's pretend. And I've, I've plugged the stuff in. Um, so, yep, this now has to be a tap, not a ton, because it's got to do that, all that layer two stuff. Um, but, you know, Packet D could now talk DHCP. If there's, a, if there's a DHCP server out here that gave this thing its IP address, Packet D can now do the same thing, because remember DHCP is like an Ethernet broadcast, like, hey, is there anyone out there with the authority to give out IPs? Something will reply, and that, you know, that broadcast will span this, because it is, it is the one layer two network. It's just now comprised of two switches, and one of those switches is software. The thing about this is that neither of these arrows is now dangling. Remember, they have to be dangling for me to, for like the amorphous gray box to do anything with them. So I, I can't assign an address to either of these two now because they're subsumed into the switch, right? So there's actually, with this setup, there's no way for another random process, like a ping process or an Nginx process, to talk to or receive information from the outside world because I have no free plugs, um, so I then therefore can't assign any addresses. They are, they're kind of subsumed. Luckily, bridges, um, the Linux bridge, uh, they all have what's called an implicit port or a host port. 
Um, they call it a port. It's not a socket. It's more like an interface. It's a plug. Um, so you know, imagine I've taken my physical switch, I've plugged the two computers in, and now I want to like start talking to the rest of the world. I can get another cable and plug it in, right? And there's another dangling RJ45. I can do something with. So you always get one of these things for free um, with every bridge. This is what actually started me on the rabbit hole of, of working all this stuff out, is that I got really confused by this. Um, so this interface is called BR0. Um, it has the same name as the bridge. So there is a namespace of bridges. They all have names. The first bridge you make is called BR0. You can rename it, right? But in the, in the space of bridges, there might be a BR0 bridge and a BR1 bridge. BRCTL, bridge control, bridge cuddle, if you're doing Kubernetes stuff, um, the cloud native hug. Um, is, don't, is, uh, <laughs> please don't, it's too, it's too early. Um, this bridge is called BR0, this lives in the namespace of bridge names, BRCTL will show you it. If you do I, if config or if you say IP link uh, list, IP address list, you will see a BR0, you are seeing this host port, you cannot manipulate the bridge with this. This is, this really confused me because you can actually apply IP tables rules to like both. You can catch packets here, you can catch them there. You need to know which fucking BR0 you're talking about. They're different. <laughs> They're different. Um, IFCTL, despite what the man page says these days, really isn't the way to like manipulate bridges. You're gonna be, you're gonna be hitting this and it's kind of confusing. Anyway, every bridge, internal port, put an address on it. So this computer now, and notice this is actually the address because this, this machine, this gray box, you know, this stuff aside, like your web browser on this machine actually needs like an IP address to use to talk to the internet. So this machine's address, as it were, has now been the DHCP client goes in through this because this is the only way to the outside world. It's this interface that takes the sort of address for this moral machine. Um, and it's BR0 that you'll use because ETH0 is, is subsumed. It's plugged into that bridge. Um, Oh, I'm actually not doing so well on time. Okay, uh, so Linux Bridge is an implementation of a switch in software. There are many. Um, BR0 there changes to OVS0. Open vSwitch is another implementation of software switching. It's got a bunch more features. It's a bit more heavyweight. It's just standard trade-off. Right, this bridge was never as simple as um, one of those like back-to-back -back Ethernet wire uh, adapters, right? It was always more like a racked switch. So it can have, as, but it can have as many ports as you want. Uh, it supports, it does Mac learning. It support, it, it's, a, it's a switch, not a hub, right? It does Mac learning. It supports spanning tree protocol, blah, blah, blah. Open vSwitch has got even more features, traffic management and that kind of stuff. Um, this is a sort of top-down view of the system. If you looked at it from the side, and this is where if I could draw, there'd be like a magic 3D thing would happen. OVS is kind of quite deep. So the Linux bridge and OVS, you are built on all of the kernel's networking mechanism. They use its IP stack and its TCP stack and stuff. Um, so if a packet wants to come from the outside and get to packet D, it kind of goes through all the layers of TCP, um, you know, here and here and here and here. Um, and this, and it's, it, as I say, uh, in net IP tables, NetFilter can, can pick it up at any of those points. That's great, it gives you a lot of power and flexibility, but it's not particularly quick. Um, so there are a bunch, it's a, it's a separate talk, we won't go over it, but there, is a, there are a bunch of alternatives to open vSwitch and the Linux bridge that basically carve right through the networking stack and say, I know that all this, this thing is not pretending to be an expensive like Cisco top of rack switch doing traffic monitoring and flow control and rate limiting and stuff. Um, all it's doing is punting packets, like punting frames backwards and forwards as fast as it can. So I don't need any of that network, I don't need you know, explicit congestion notification or anything. I'm just gonna carve right your way through the kernel and just like uh, bang these pages together in kernel space. So there's a bunch of the, like netmap veil, snap switch, uh, VPP, if anybody's heard of any of these things. Um, DPDK acceleration comes in here, like again, a completely separate talk. But there's, this is a very common pattern of putting things together, plugging things together like this and all, often all you're doing is is just moving packets backwards and forwards, like your actual sort of traffic control will be done at the edge or the top of rack. So you don't need a load of features there, so you can throw it all away and get a bunch of speed back. But that is, that is a separate talk. So I'm gonna have to speed up a bit. Um, packet D was, you know, our page of C that knows how to recognize a valid like ping just about and send a valid response just about. So I can ping it. You should, you should write it, it's kind of fun. Um, but 
what if that you, it's just a Unix process? What if it was something more interesting? What if it were a hypervisor? What if it were QMU and KVM? So actually, inside the green box is another computer. It's turtles all the way down, right? What if inside this thing, this was more software pretending to be another gray box, um, pretending to have an E1000 running a whole other kernel that can do exactly the same thing and assign a MAC address and IP address to this? Um, well, that's how a virtual machine works, um, and this is how they're networked. This is how they're connected to the outside world, is they will get a tap, um, and this, this green box, this Unix process, now does a whole load of stuff, obviously, because it's a whole virtual machine, but one of the things that QMU does is understands how to talk tap on the one side and how to pretend that it's an E1000 on the other side because you've got a kernel that's expecting to do you know, normal network driving. So that's the short version of how um, VMs work. You can get packets in and out of VMs in all of the ways I showed before. So you can actually NAT them, you can forward them with the IP forwarding thing, or you can plug them into bridges like this. The advantage is it's then actually on the same network that the, that the outer host machine is on, so it can do DHCP, it can respond to ARPs and all of that good stuff that you don't get if you try to do IP-only stuff. Um, do I have a slide on this? Yeah, very quickly to mention that if you think about this, it's slightly absurd um, that this, this process basically gets an Ethernet frame, it gets a, a buffer containing an Ethernet frame containing an IP packet and whatever. Um, but it then, because it's emulating a computer, it then has to say, right, what set of uh, register values and interrupts would um, be produced by a, like a, a, an E1000 if it actually got this thing? So you're kind of, you, you've, you've pulled it off the wire and you've turned it into a nice buffer in memory, and then you hand, have to kind of reverse that and turn it back into like fake wire transactions so that this kernel can then use its driver to unpick those fake wire transactions and turn it back into a buffer, of, like a contiguous buffer of memory. Um, <sighs> That works. This is how we ran Windows unmodified, like back in the day. It's very, very slow. Um, so you now, uh, these things can, uh, can collaborate. If, if the green box, if the operating system in the green box knows it's being hypervised, you can do a thing called power virtualization, which basically says, right, the, the, this thing, this driver is now not the E1000 driver. It's a driver called Vertio Net. This is a driver that knows it's being virtualized and basically shares, ring buff uh, shares a ring buffer, just shares pages with the thing on the outside. It's way, way quicker. Um, again, hypervision, virtualization, power virtualization, Vertio Net and ring buffers, so that's a whole other talk. Um, but content, like VMs are old hat. We're, this is 2019. What if this was an orange box, which is a container? Because containers are cool. Containers are just a software isolation mechanism, right? So I can have a couple of, I can have a sender and a receiver, I can have a couple of Unix processes, and they're just in this sort of true on steroids. Right, they're within this um, container. There's no emulator here, there's no hardware, there's being emulated, there's no other um, the kernel. They're running on the host kernel, but they're in this magic box. This magic box is comprised of several things. As I say, it's a software isolation mechanism. There was an awesome talk on C groups earlier. C groups are sort of hardware isolation and rate limiting. That's how you uh, restrict access to pieces of hardware. Um, you can make entire PCI cards sort of disappear, or you can rate limit access to them. Um, and then there's the software side of things, which is namespaces. So there's a PID namespace, which means that if this, if, if ping makes the system call to say what other processes are on the system. It gets to see Nginx, but it doesn't get to see anything out here. Right, classic software isolations, how Kubernetes and whatever all work. One of the six namespaces that comprise a container is the network namespace. So ping in here cannot see any sort of, remember I said all of this stuff, sort of north of the hardware, north of the firmware is a figment of software's imag imagination, including this dangling blue arrow. So ping here can't see this interface because it's outside of its network namespace. Um, it can't, it's not affected by any IP tables rules out here. It doesn't even, it can't read the root table that's out here. It, it is isolated as if it's in another machine. So I need to get it on the network and I can't because it's, it, we've just gone and isolated it from the network. Introducing a new kind of interface. Um, you know, I said before with that foo zero, I can, I can imagine that I have a, uh, Blue Arrow, and it's backed by software. And previously, we backed it by Packet D or QMU. But what if I just back it with another one? What if I just make two of these Blue Arrows, and if you put something in one end, it just comes out the other, right? I can give them both addresses. Um, I could then have, uh, you know, Netcat on one side. You could try this at home. You can have Netcat on one side and 
curl on the other, and you can sort of type down this magical pipe as if it's two separate computers. Why not? It's a sort of, you know, shitty loopback. But the use of these VEFs, uh, so this is called a virtual Ethernet uh, pair. So each one of these is an adapter, it's an interface, but they always come in pairs. Um, they're called VEF after the type of thing that they are. So you'll get VEF0, VEF1, and then you'll get VEF2, VEF3. It's a plug, so I can plug it into a, into a socket. Right? I put one end in the bridge, and then I move the other end into this network namespace. But it's dangling. It's not plugged into anything. It's dangling. It can be used. It can be given an address. But it's now within this network namespace, so Ping and Nginx can see it. This FTPD out here can't see it, can't bind to this address, and likewise, Ping can't use BR0. So that's, that's the use of VETH pairs. Uh, and what we do, again, subtle change of the slide, is we take VETH1, and you can actually call it whatever you want. So we rename it ETH0, and then the thing in here, you know, unless it's actually quite smart about grubbing around the system, really has no idea it's in a container at all. Uh, if you start making things you know, quack like they would. Um, th that's, I mean, that's security through obscurity. It's not a useful thing to do. But uh, Docker does rename these things ETH0 just so that crappy software that is expecting to find something called ETH0 to bind to doesn't get too confused. That's not how you should be selecting the interface to bind to, obviously. Um, as, a pr as a practical point, these VETH pairs, they had like weird testing uses before, and then containers came along, and now they're used everywhere. Um, you actually you know that you're always going to plug one end into a bridge, so really you don't need a VETH pair. You don't need all the software that comes with it. What you actually want is one of those internal ports. You want to say, hey, bridge, dangle me a wire out so I can do something with it. And it turns out that those bridges, as well as having as many sockets as you want, can have as many of those internal ports as you want. So what really happens um, is you just make the right brctl command that Docker does to make a new, uh, yet another internal port, and it slings that inside the network namespace. That's a that's a practical detail. Oh, I'm really running out of time. You're not going to... Okay, VLANs are a thing. <coughs> VLANs are complicated. I've got a load of speaker notes, but I'm going to skip most of it because um, we're running out of time. Basically to say that when you had one of those <coughs> trunk ports back in the day, when you knew you, your wire to the switch um, could, could put you on any VLAN if only you tagged your frame with the right VLAN ID, the way you actually got that tagging done was a, a yet another interface type of, of type VLAN. So this interface here is of type VLAN, um, and it's one of the it's the first one we'll see where this is what's called an upper interface, and it's it's again not backed by hardware directly. It's not backed by a process or another dangling end either. It's backed by like it has to have a, be associated with a lower interface because it is actually doing stuff to the wire. Um, but we make another interface here. And any, we give it an address, and anything that goes in and out of this interface goes down this wire just like stuff sent to ETH0, but it's tagged with VLAN ID 42 as it goes. So it ends up, when it hits that trunk port that says, right, you're an admin, you can be on any VLAN, which one do you want to be on? It ends up on the right one. So this, the software that's actually like trying to talk to, just trying to talk to Amazon doesn't have to know about like, what, what VLAN should I be using to get there. That's all taken care of by the system. Um, so that's probably all I'll say on those, except it's important to note that they are a, this is the next slide show that, it is a separate interface. So these interface, because I, I could have put another address on ETH0, right, and done some magic setup somewhere that says, well, anything that's using the 172 address actually wants to get tagged VLAN ID 42. Imagine the kernel could have been built like that. The, the thing is, you then have two addresses on one interface. The magic thing about having a separate interface <laughs> A separate thing that you see in like IF config is that interfaces can be namespaced. So I can now sling that into a container. Um, loads of speaking notes are here on the history, um, but basically saying like this actually. So what happens if I have these containers and I want to network them all together? I can make a bunch of VETH pairs, plug them all into one bridge, and they can all talk to each other. That's great. It's also quite slow. I mean, if there's a takeaway, then you know we have all the building blocks we need to make a modern container system work. All right, and I'll. I'm just worried about I'm not going to get to that slide at the end. Um, so you can, do, you can do this with as many of these orange box containers as you want, right? And then your, your one computer then becomes a load of little computers. You have all your containers, and they can all talk to each other. And they can all talk to containers on another machine with the same setup, because you're literally on the same network, right? You've just made a network of a load of switches. Um, this is fine. This is all, all the building blocks we need. The rest of this talk is about making it go a little bit quicker and some of the advances that have come along. 
So through some historical accident, we're getting close now because I've got, a, I've got an interface, I can namespace it, I can make a bunch of these, put them in a bunch of containers. These containers can now talk to each other without either having to configure one of those like complicated you know, snap switch fast things or without having to use a Linux bridge which is quite slow and takes a lot of admin. But this doesn't work. Obviously this container can't talk to another container that's on VLAN 69 because VLANs are an isolation mechanism, right? They were designed for a completely different reason. The, the VLAN ID is to kind of multiplex things down this wire and what the upstream switch is going to do is absolutely try its hardest to keep them apart, right? VLANs are an isolation mechanism. So this looks on the inside like it might almost be close to what we want, close to getting these containers to be able to talk to each other without a bridge, but it's absolutely not going to work precisely because VLANs are a really strong isolation mechanism. Um, so imagine I build this. Imagine I'm like, well, this is software. I can do whatever I want. So I'm going to make more of these magic upper interfaces. Um, I'm going to bind them all to this lower interface. They all use the same wire. I'm going to call this one ETH1 and this one ETH2. And now I've got you know, my three addresses, but they're all on separate interfaces, which can all be namespaced. Really close, right? I can put them all in, in containers. Um, this doesn't work. Um, I want them to talk to each other, uh, but it's, I've removed the VLAN tagging. So previously, my sort of hardware address, to get, to get things to here, I would stick the MAC address and the VLAN ID in the frame. And my hardware address then kind of became those coordinates, right? those two separate addresses. And together, uh, VLAN ID, ID 0 plus the MAC address is this. VLAN ID 42 plus the MAC address is this. Now I've taken the VLAN tags out. They've all just got one hardware address. They've all just got coffee, coffee, or whatever this is. So there's no way to really, so the upstream switch sees, remember it has that ARP table. Um, it sees three IP addresses, one MAC address, and it goes, that doesn't make any sense. That's, that's completely wrong. Um, so this is close, but it's not gonna work because you can't really share the same layer two address like that. So we make a slight change, and we now have these upper interfaces, um, and we give them all separate MAC addresses. So one piece of hardware, one PCI slot, one cable, but basically pretending to be three uh, interface, three network cards because they all have separate MAC addresses. This is a, a new type of thing. This is called MAC VLAN, um, yet another kind of interface. So uh, as I say, these aren't real NICs. Um, they're, you know, they aren't all connected by a real wire to a real switch, um, but they don't VLAN tag either. So this is, this is MAC VLAN. And these things can all be put into, into the same container. But how would these containers talk to each other? I guess this is the last thing I'll, I'll do. It's quite interesting. How would these containers talk to each other? Well, before we had a bridge. And we wanted to get rid of the bridge because the bridge had a load of features and was slow and was hard to administer. Um, but imagine if Mac VLAN is software, I can do whatever I want. Imagine if it was sort of interface plus bridge. So I can put a Mac VLAN interface. So, so this thing is a Mac VLAN interface, like lower interface, and then these are its upper, upper interfaces. So when I say Mac VLAN, I kind of mean this thing, even though it's got three of these, these arrows. I'm overloading my terms a bit. Um, so I can put this thing, this, this interface, into bridge mode, which basically says, hey, be a bridge. If ETH1 wants to talk to ETH2, bridge it, as if we had one of those Linux bridges. But it's better, because I don't have to administer a bridge, and this thing could be way faster. Right, because it knows all the MAC addresses it's ever going to see. Because the things aren't plugged into it by cables, they're kind of part of it. So because, because it's managing these lower interfaces, it knows every MAC it's going to see. It doesn't have to learn them. It doesn't have to run sp spanning tree protocol because it knows it can't possibly be plugged into itself because that's just not, you don't actually have any cables. So this thing could be way faster. You could put it into bridge mode and it's basically interface plus like minimum viable fastest bridge. This is great, and I've then got a bunch of interfaces I can just throw into, uh, into containers. The other thing I can actually do is put it into a weird thing called VEPA hairpin mode, which says, don't bridge them yourself, just dump them on the wire and let the upstream switch do it. This may sound a little bit, as if I literally had three network cards, right, with three separate MAC addresses. Um, this may seem a little bit silly, but there can be some advantages. A, it can actually be quicker than doing it because this is there has to be a code path doing this right and if you're on some little embedded device trying to run a few Docker containers for like security isolation your MIPS might not be that fast if you're plugged into some big iron switch this actually may be quicker and that switch may have 
by the way, said we wanted to eliminate the bridge because we don't need its features, that switch may have a bunch of features. It might be doing traffic control, it might be doing logging, it might be doing filtering. So if you want that, you know, you don't try to emulate it in software in a Linux bridge because it's going to be slow, it's going to use RAM. You've already got a big iron switch. So just make the, 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 this host as dumb as possible, dump them all on the wire and let the upstream switch do it. Um, the problem is that switch, although you've got separate MAC addresses, the switch isn't going to like it because it's going to see more than one MAC address down the same actual wire. Um, because you know, if there were three three computers, there'd be three separate wires. You've now got three MAC. It's like, oh, there's three network cards, but they're all on the same at the end, uh, end of the same wire. That's not how it works. So you're likely to trigger a bunch of like anti-spoofing stuff on an old-fashioned switch. So this doesn't necessarily always work. Um, oh, and there's also like a private mode that says if it does get hairpin back, drop it. This is kind of poor man's VLANs. Ignore that. Don't ever set that option. Um, okay. One one final thing. Quite often, what I want to do is I want the reason I'm making a bunch of uh, virtual interfaces is because I want to run a bunch of VMs rather than containers. So they need to go into taps. I've got like two plugs, right? Two plugs can't plug into each other. I need to connect them. How do I do it? Well, I have to plug my Mac VLAN zero into a bridge and then plug the other side into the tap because taps are both plugs. So there is another type of interface called a Mac V tap, um, which is basically a, a Mac VLAN with a tap on the end so I don't have to do this bridge. Skip, you know, skip a few more uh, cycles. Uh, I think you're probably going to get saved from the rest of the explanation. So you separate MAC addresses were working around the fact that the switch and other hosts wouldn't like seeing a, a bunch of IPs on the same MAC address, like ARP and stuff would get confused. Really, that was just a, like that protocol just wasn't fit for purpose anymore. It was out of date. Um, so you don't these days you actually can use the same MAC address for everything because we just waited basically for switches and other networking gear to catch up and say, oh no, this isn't an attack. Um, you, you secure, the security boundaries move. This isn't an attack. There's other mitigations against that. So it, it's totally fine. So if you are able to have the same thing, then we're back to that kind of idealized box that I drew before, right? Is I've got one PCI card, but I want a bunch of separate interfaces so I can give them all separate addresses and dangle them all into separate network namespaces. That's this setup. It's called IPVLAN. And it's if you've got the infrastructure to support it, this is kind of as good as it gets. Bunch of notes that I won't go through. I need to say that, well, actually, do you even need a MAC address at all? Probably not. Um, so this is actually a thing called IPVLAN layer two. You can have an, an inter interface of type IPVLAN layer three, which only has an IP address, doesn't have a MAC address. Um, so that gets rid of all the fucking around with Macs, but it does mean that you have to root. If this thing wants to talk to this thing, then your interface can't suddenly be a bridge anymore. It has to be a router, and it has to have an IP, which means subtle change. All of these addresses are now in separate subnets because they have to be because you have to root them. And you can't do DHCP anymore because you can't do the Ethernet broadcast necessary. So like, you can trade eliminating the Macs for a bunch of other administrative overhead. But imagine if you had a way to do um, all, you, all you need to be able to do is a IP allocation uh, through some side channel without using DHCP. Uh, and you have to be able to do something else. Oh, and you, yeah, you, uh, things have to be happy to be in separate subnets and to be routed. And you need to be able to find those subnets. So there's now another computer off screen. It's talking down that wire. Not only does this computer have like, it doesn't have more than one MAC address anymore, which is good, but it does have more than one IP address, which is a bit confusing. And all of those IP addresses are in completely separate subnets, right? They're on separate networks. So this machine now looks like some gateway to like multiple networks of multiple computers. That's really confusing. So in order to get the packets to land down the wire, you need to tell your upstream machines um, that like there's effectively a whole set of networks down that wire. And this is, so this thing suddenly looks like a big iron router. This is what BGP is for. So you can make this, and we're only wiring containers together. So you can make this work, but you need to set up like a fucking bird. You need to set up a, a BGP thing to advertise all of these networks. And then this will say that, okay, 192.168.1 slash 24, 192.168.2 slash 24 are all down the end of this wire. And it does work, and you need a, but you need a control plane to do it, and it's a load of effort. This is what the Calico overlay network does. If you're using a Kubernetes cluster, you are probably using Calico. It's really complicated. It works. It's, it's diabolical genius by whoever came up with it. Well, I met him. He's a bit mental. Um, it does work. <laughs> And it's built on, this was the point of this talk, it's built on all of these building blocks underneath, right? And hopefully you've seen the historical context of how we got through VLANs, how we got through Mac VLAN, 
which was just uh, waiting for the hardware to catch up to IPVLAN layer 2. IPVLAN layer 3 is sort of a weird local optimum. It needs a lot of um, setting up. Actually, the honestly, most systems these days are built like this, and you have more than one container, and they're plugged into a bridge, honestly. Or you do some kind of overlay network with a sort of point-to-point. -point. You, you VPN a few of these. You NAT, and then you VPN them together. Um, that's, that's a bunch of slides I'm not going to reach. But those are all the building blocks. So then when you see, this is the picture I drew myself. I found this in the archive when I was actually trying to get my head around Calico and debug it. I drew this. Hopefully, you now have the building blocks to be able to understand this kind of diagram. Um, this, yeah, this was a sort of motivating example to give you a tour of all the network types in, in all the interface types in the kernel. Um, but don't think that the most advanced and most recent is necessarily the best, because it is a bit of a weird local optimum, and it comes with a bunch of overhead. And you really have to think about sort of how routing and BGP works to use it. But yeah, I saw some people. Everyone seems to want to take a picture of that. Sure, that's how I think Calico works. <laughs> totally. Um, yeah, Felix is their kind of control thing, and then that manages Bird that actually advertises the routes and whatever. Hopefully now you have the, uh, the mental model and the building blocks to build this. So we saw, yeah, a bunch of interface types. We actually didn't even mention loopback. Uh, there's a dummy interface in the kernel for doing testing stuff. There's the real or physical, as we're going to talk it, call it. You can stick more than one IP address on an interface. Um, that's not technically an interface type, but it is another way of setting things up, so it comes in the same kind of bucket. There's taps, there's tons, there's the VETH pairs that we saw. Um, there's the VLAN sub-interfaces, which if you're still using VLANs are a thing. There's Mac VLAN and this associated Mac VTAP. There's IP VLAN and the associate, um, IP VTAP layer two. And then there's the layer three mode. If you read the kernel header like six months ago or whenever I put these slides together, I swear that's it. I'm out of time anyway, so you better hope it is. Um, thanks. Thank you.